Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Test Case Scenario. I'm your host, Jason Baum. And today we have a special treat for our listeners. Um, I have my esteemed panelists with me, as always, Marcus Merrill and Evelyn Coleman. And today we're joined by Matt Clark. Mac has been at the forefront of video game development, ensuring some of the world's largest studios deliver top-notch game experiences. From pioneering fintech to independently creating a video game using Unreal Engine, Mac's journey is nothing short of inspiring. And today we get to dive deep into the challenges and intricacies of game development, drawing insights from the 2023 game experience report that Sauce Labs put out, and just talking in general a bit about debugging. Mac. Thanks for uh, for climbing down here and joining us in the uh, in test case scenario podcast. Uh, absolutely, so good to be here. It's it's really great to to see you. First of all, uh, always like chatting with you, uh, and getting to talk uh, as part of the podcast about something that you're really passionate about: game development and debugging, um, which makes it tough to ask our very first question. Um, So uh, the first question that I'll ask is actually around this game experience report. Um, I I have read it now multiple times. I know you've read it. Um, There's some scary numbers in this report specifically around um, games, how often they're coming out and the completion of which the games are coming out, the amount of bugs that exist. And then talking about bullying uh, of the game developers because of such buggy, bad games, and then the impact on franchises. Um, So let's just start right there. Um, The report mentioned that 48% of developers have felt threatened online due to a game they've worked on. Have you ever faced that kind of a challenge before? And if you did, how'd you handle it? Um, Wow. Okay. Uh, it's yeah, a doozy so to start with. It's but a we doozy like to, to start just go with. right deep, um, right, deep right right away. I think I think it's interesting. Um, I gave a talk, succeed by failing in GDC. It's it's currently in in the vault, um, and I actually kind of addressed a little bit of this. Uh, which one I, I want to set aside the toxicity conversation for right now, but and just focus in on what do you do with feedback um, that mm-hmm. can be toxic. So on Steam, um, my game's fishing on the fly, and you can look right now, and you can see there's a couple people that gave negative reviews. Um, and they have no, they have like 0.1 hour total in steam and they just like there to troll you. So first of all, you, you just have that general level of trolling that you're going to get from game developers. Um, and, and that actually in the talk, I talk about, uh, succeed by failing. I talk about the fact that you could use our crash and error reporting to verify what they're saying. Right. I didn't have any insight. They're like, my game's crashing here. Da, 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 da. And I can be like, well, tell me what your CPU Ram makeup and GPU are. And the day that it crashed on, and I can look you up and verify you and qualify you or disqualify you immediately as either trolling me to myself or to Steam as a platform or other platforms. So I think that's really important is to realize when you're being trolled. And then you have the second part, which is there's so many people with passion, right, about video games. They're just, they love them. And and unfortunately, as they, they, there's a line that gets crossed sometimes, and, and, you know, and the industry itself has some toxicity it needs to deal with. 100%. But that passion will miss, will spill over into something else. They want that game to be better. So they're going to pressure those devs that are already under pressure from their organization to leave this game within this certain period of time, right? Because there's there's money here. And then there's a whole adjustment. We can, you know, we, we've gone to software as a service. We can release buggy games. We can kind of get away with that. But really, it's starting to backfire on organizations that have done that. So uh, like as an example, Fallout 76 released to extremely horrible reviews and the player base abandoned them. Um, I think Battlefield uh, 2023 also uh, had their player base abandon them and they didn't have good crash and error reporting at all. They, they even made a comment in the when they're releasing it, ha, we're Bethesda. I love Bethesda. Don't get me wrong. They make great games, but you just can't 2042, the Battlefield 2042. They can't make the these games and, and release them buggy because 25% of people that have that crash in a game or in an app, they'll leave. They'll never come back. And they they misplaced how loyal these player bases would be. And then the player bases themselves took it out on the developers when really it's a business decision. I love the direction that you're taking this question um, and turning it towards 
some of the, I guess, the methods uh, that exist today in getting a game out and sort of the and the game, um, the game companies, right? So let's let's talk about that for I, I mean, Marcus, you you have experience in in gaming. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, but but yeah, it's funny. I worked on games from two, uh, it's like 1995 to 1997. I worked for a, a game company in, in Austin, Texas called Origin that was headed up by this almost cultish figure, Richard Garriott. If you look him up on Wikipedia, he's got all sorts of entries. He went into space, you know, he did all this stuff and he had so much personality and he wrote a game series that lasted for so long. It was so venerable. It's called Ultima. And um, I worked on the ninth iteration of that game, Ultima 9, which had a seven-year release process. And I remember during that seven years, it was, you know, it was promised to be released in, I don't remember what year, 91, 92, and then it took until 1997, I think. During that time, more than one person broke into the man's house um, and, and got thrown in jail and got taken away. People people would looking show up for the game, Looking for him to, yeah, uh, presumably to... <laughs> be like where's the game or people wow. would show up sometimes when their games didn't work and they would threaten violence like this was a actually a a thing that was happening in 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 that time but the thing is back then we had to sort of get the game perfect if it releases in 1997 the only way to patch the game is to send out a cd or very very unlikely scenario that someone's got an always on internet connection they have to download a patch that's going to be 60 megabytes that on a 2400 baud modem is going to take 17 hours and your mom's going to try to make a phone call and mess up the download. And I mean, <laughs> there was no ability to ship a game that was so low quality. And yet there was a game infamous game called battle cruiser 3000 AD that did that. They did exactly that. They shipped a game that far sooner than they should have. And the game just, it just vanished from, if you look it up now, it's like, it, it didn't do well. Another company bought the IP and tried to re-release under a different kind of title. It was just, Games back then also lived and died by bugs, but the testing rigor and the release cycle was so different. It could, it just, it, it's hard to compare the two even. It's such a completely different mindset. What has happened to make that change? Uh, I think SAS, honestly, I think SAS is the answer. Uh, tell me, Mac, if I'm wrong. No, I think the the game started patching. The, the, the online element came apart and, and then I think it started getting abused. Uh, I think the yeah. original patches were great. Um, you know, and they were there to, you know, they legitimately were trying to make, um, and then also the, the methodology for, for releasing software, right? It was, Hey, we, we do a requirements document, um, upfront, we capture all the requirements, right? Um, yeah. I worked in the banking industry. And so when we go to release a bank, right, you could imagine that we're trying to capture everything at the point of release and then we're done and we're, we're not touching that code for years. Uh, and that's the same thing with these, these games that were on CD. So with that patching, then came waterfall, agile, and these methods that we we put up on this soapbox, right? But at the same time, it allows you to ship lower quality software uh, if if you're so inclined, and then to clean up afterwards and patch, uh, and mm -hmm. or really start releasing things that aren't even ready to be released. And I think that's what yeah. you saw is this this progression. Also, there's a go ahead, Evelyn. I was just going to ask if the complexity of the games was led to any of this as well. I'm, again, a baby gamer. I just got my first console a few months ago. Um, and then I heard about a game that was released recently that has like 1,700 different endings or something that could be, or side quests, or like so many hours that you can play this game besides the main bit. And just like, you know, we see in other types of software testing, right, there's like a critical path which is the path that most users are going to take through the game. And then there's side quests and things that some like people might not even discover for years. So is this part of it too, where it's just like um, trying to get the margins right on what to test or is it mostly just the SAS bit? Um, I, I wonder if Mac has a different view my my instinct tells me that yes of course that's part of it but the the bugs that i'm seeing take over the conversation have less to do with functionality than they do around sort of multiplayer experience and performance testing issues and things like that like environmental and configuration concerns not actual game functionality mac do you, would, would you go along with that or do you have a different take 
Yeah, I mean, I think with gaming, the other really, really difficult part is, I mean, you could segment these out to so many different types. Like, let's look at Android devices by an example. There's tens of thousands of them, right? So, of course, you're going to have edge cases that nothing's going to be performing on in, you know, consoles, and then you're trying to deliver here. It's interesting, uh, Marcus, I did play Ultima Online all the way through all those versions and Ultima Online and did get eventually banned. That's a totally separate conversation between the two of us. Uh, Baldur's, Baldur's Gate That's going to be my follow-up question. Oh, no, no. Uh, Baldur's, Baldur's Gate, Gate 3, yeah, it's probably, 3 yeah. is what I'm currently playing. Um, I'm on level 6. It's the one you're talking about with 1,700 different endings. I That is a game I think that's the exception. It goes back to exactly what Marcus was talking about. Because of these 1,700 endings, I really feel that they tried really hard. They, they took seven to nine years to release this, I think, between. They, they've been developing it for a very, very long time. Uh, that said, it's been released for three weeks, I think, and it's on the fourth patch. And they had to roll back a hotfix as well. So it is a combination of all of these different elements that you cannot master, that you do have to have a process and something in place to manage and mitigate all of the different niche platforms and, and a strategy and sound testing involved. If you did take the correct strategy um, and use all of the different things of the CICD pipeline today that we have, I think you could mitigate tremendous number of, of crashes and errors. And and these problems and we're starting to see that right but there is some complexity around that testing that that becomes sensitive um interestingly enough working with these bigger studios i do see them that embrace that products like backtrace um where we're starting to shift left and i'm not sure if people here understand kind of what that means I, I know this panel does but shifting left is is getting uh like a product like backtrace that gets crashes and errors normally with like the player base upon release and then they prioritize they get right down to it but today we're starting to see AI come into play with synthetic player bases. Uh, Ubisoft, as an example, this last GDC, they had a whole big thing. Everybody was whispering about it, where they have multiple thousands of players that are robots, in essence, or synthetic players playing their game, pushing these crashes and errors into a solution like Backtrace before release. Then you get visibility. You're not you're not being reactive, right? You're being proactive. So I think there's a lot of approaches that people can do to ship higher quality software and higher quality games in general. Right. You know, there's a there's a tragic story a couple of years ago from a game, uh, not real tragedy, just tragedy is relative, from a game called Star Wars Squadrons that uh, if you know me long enough, you know, and I used to talk about it obsessively, but the day it was released, it was this amazing game in that when you play through the single player, when you when you did some basic multiplayer online stuff, the game was more or less flawless, like it worked beautifully. And everyone sort of agreed when you get to the cockpit of the X-Wing, it's unbelievable. And even in VR, you turn your head and there's R2-D2. It was a flawless, beautiful experience. But there was one problem in that in the multiplayer experience during a ladder tournament game, the way they calculated the ranks was incorrect. And that one bug on release day killed the game. So imagine going through and you get all your functionality, all your graphics processing, all your modeling correct, all your art is correct. Your user interface is beautiful. You know how to release in-game content after the thing is shipped. Functionality is great. Load testing is great. You can handle 30,000 players at once, but because of one flaw in something that is really, really, really hard to test before release, the whole thing just tanks. And they went from 30,000 users to several hundred within a month. And it's unbelievable how that can happen. You know, that's, that's interesting, Marcus, because, and I, this question, you know, I want to ask Mac, you know, with, with movie gaming and with the complexity of games today, I'm just curious, how do you even prioritize what bugs to tackle first? Like, especially when multiple issues arise simultaneously and you have the multiplayer, you have the single, you know, the, the single player storyline version, you know, there's so much, where do you begin how do you it's begin? A great question. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great. Question. Uh, I mean, I, I think just because I've I've watched, I think now about a hundred other people's talks uh, uh, and and other stuff. So I've really tried to gather as much information um, beyond just my game or the games that I've been associated with. That uh, I've been lucky enough to get this visibility across some of the top, I think, twenty studios, uh, twenty of the twenty five back backtrace currently uses. Um, so we have some statistics, um, some publications that talk about, hey. Uh, that number one thing, what breaks your user experience the most, whether it's an app or a game, that's a crash. It's an A&R, it's an out of memory, it's a hang. You have to full tilt stop everything you're doing and address that. And, and that's, that's an opinion, okay? That's an opinion. 
Um, but I think it's a very informed opinion to say, hey, you know, give me an automated Slack, give me an automated Jira ticket, hit me, hit that developer right on the top of the head and say, right now, let's get this resolved before we lose any more players. I think that's critical, that, that sort of recognition of what that represents. Now, things that don't break, break the player experience, but directly affect them across a, the broadest swath of people, right? In Backtrace's instance, we use deduplication. So if something comes across a million times, we'll tell you one time that it's happened a million times and we'll put it at the top of the stack for you to see. So frequency, what is also impacting across the broadest and then what's impacting the hardest. Those are my two judgments that I look at. And then I'm also trying to filter out things like edge devices that aren't practical, right? There's going to always be somebody unhappy because they're on an older version of a PC, they're on an older version of a phone. And you you do have to draw that line and say, I'm going to reject these pieces and filter out that noise because I've outlined that. You need to outline it and say on Steam, this is what I support. This is the phone I support or, you know, and then follow through with that. You can't make everybody happy. That's the un the unfortunate part. Um, and I was going to share a quick story with it because it's making me think with my game in particular, with Marcus's story, like my game is set up. If you want to play it to go catch fish, to go have fun and experience it, it's going to work great. If you try to break my game, it will break. That's, I, you know, it, there's, there's that bias built into it too. Like, a developer doesn't, when they're building something, they're not thinking, hey, let me go try to break the game 5,000 ways and then make fun of you online for it. They're thinking a player is going to come on board and be like, okay, great. You know, if, if I play it the way that it's intended, which is to have fun and to learn and to experience virtual butterflies and have this world. I mean, I modeled USGS real, these are fish I caught, 70% of them in real life. They're the models I built. They're real HD insects, they're real rivers, they're, they're USGS spatial data. All that should be to somebody who wants to learn to fly fish, um, a lower barrier to entry, and I'm, I'm compressing time, right? I'm recognizing your time factor. So a thousand hours on a river, maybe I'm giving that to you in 50 hours playing my game. That was a goal I set out was to recognize how important time was. But if you want to wreck my game and you want to break my game and you want to say, yeah. And that's kind of where we are too with these people. I think everybody kind of goes out and they're like, well, let me jump. 5,000 times off the map and then fall and then now make fun of you for it, which again goes back to that bowling and developer. And is that really necessary for the experience? No, it's horrendous and it's toxic. Yeah, I've gotten to where I do a lot of games happy path now just because I'm no longer interested in trying to break them. I can, it's so easy to break games. I'd rather try to play what the developer intended, you know, for the most part. And I think there's just too many folks out there who, you know, they want to, they want to be the lulls. I wonder if that's why I haven't run into very many bugs like in my console few months uh playing games is that uh I always just play like start to end I don't go I'm not like a completionist I, it's, it says like you can do you did it once but you can come back and do it two more times and open up the rest of the doors like okay, I'm gone I'm playing it straight through um which I think mortifies some of my friends <laughs> but I've I've run I've been playing for three months and I've run into two bugs. Uh, well, three, if you include a, a game that just like wouldn't load on my phone and crashed. Um, mm. And yeah, maybe that's why. Like, well, I, I think, I think I would say also though, that, the, you know, console gaming is a little bit different from PC or mobile gaming in that with a PC game, you have, I don't know, 6 million different variables. I might have, you know, I have a better video card than you. You might have some, wow. some uh, souped up something else, not even something that's better or worse, but just different will cause some weird little memory address gap problem. It's a lot less of a problem than it used to be, but it's still definitely a problem. And then with mobile, you got iPhone 13, 12, 11 with different versions of the iOS. Whereas with a console, you'll probably have two versions of it. There's the good one and there's the, 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 the less good one. So the, the testing challenge of console is a lot more around like performance and multiplayer and stuff like that, as opposed to functionality, because there's just not as many variables. In I was just going to ask the question around that, the debugging for mobile versus, you know, for, for the, um, uh, for browser or not browser, but for the PC or for console. I'll take Mac, Mac take that one. He's it's actually a lot done harder. It. It's a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there's really good frameworks for unity. Uh, and Unreal for PC builds. Uh, Gauntlet is the example of the automated frust uh, uh, framework built in for Unreal Engine. And you can run that really easily on, on a PC build. 
Um, we have a real device farm as well. So I, I built games using those as well for our demo purposes and trying to wrap around an automated testing framework like Appium or Selenium or it doesn't, it, it does, it's not like an out of the box fit. And so uh, we're, I'm, that's where like uh, model.ai, which is a, a place that you can go and, and push into, you can almost think of it like web crawling, but with you're using the Z axis of uh, eggplant is another person who really that we partnered with that, that focuses on um, helping out games. And I've been a part of those conversations and seeing how studios use that uh, particular product as well with our real device cloud. I think it's important that you have those levels of testing, right? You have emulators and simulators for a certain price point to test against. You can do that locally, might have your own grid. And then you bring that over to sauce test here. We, we are moving towards sauce orchestrate where it is a bring your own testing platform. So you can do Python, other languages and other testing part. But I still think for, for video games in particular, uh, it is harder to test uh, on the mobile devices. Um, but luckily for us, we have those. <laughs> I mean, that's what our, we do, right? We have those real devices. We have those emulators and simulators so that you can start to do that and, and get that coverage. But before it was near impossible, right? Because normally one developer would have like, you know, an Android and one person would have an iOS. They'd be completely across the planet from each other. They can't, they can't get these devices. Even in South America, where we have some customers, those devices get stopped in shipping for up to three to six months. Imagine the latest iOS release coming to you and you can't get it for three to six months. What does that do to your testing for the latest platforms? So the cloud-based solution there makes a ton of sense, but even with that comes friction. I'm going to go back to um, uh, the bullying piece for a second. Sorry, Mac. I know you 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 didn't want to touch on it at first. <laughs> um, I, I Look, I totally get it. But the reason why I can't want to come back to it is not necessarily around the bullying of developers, although I think there is definitely a piece of it there in this question. I'm I'm seeing more and more this like culture of find the bug, share it on social, and just completely bash the game. And some of that is on the like some of that is directed towards the developer but overall it's actually <laughs> directed towards the game itself and then i actually was talking to marcus about this recently and uh and there's this one game in particular and i, I don't want to necessarily name the game but it's a franchise it's very well known that i've been playing since i was like 10 let's just put it that way and it comes out every single year i'm always excited every year i bought it and um these past couple of years, I actually haven't, um, and because of the quality of the game, and, and it's just consistently gotten worse and and buggier. And um, I actually posed that to Marcus, and I was talking to him about it. And Marcus, you were you you said something about like I bet the sales have gone down, right? That's what I was wondering. Is I, I actually think in this particular case they probably didn't go down, right? But but and and if they don't, that's bad. Like people should stop buying it. If well, yeah, if, but like, is it creating to... this culture now where people are buying it and trying to find their own bugs? Because that's what it, on social, like on Reddit, mm -hmm. on like t on Twitter X, whatever. I all I see, especially when this particular game launches, is a lot of like check out this bug. This person's a cheat code in this game, and like you know that kind of stuff. I think you have to have the stickiest IP in the world to have that good problem. If you're a business, the problem is that developers probably still feel just as much abuse, even though the the, the owners are still pushing them to, yeah, nope, well, it's not like we're going to change the plan about releasing next year's iteration. So, yeah, I, I think that that's a rough one because uh, I have a feeling sales probably aren't lower. Yeah, if you if you have if you have that brand, but I mean, I would argue even with uh, the one that I mentioned at Fallout seventy six, their player base did revolt, right? And Battlefield mm. two thousand forty two, there, there there have been player No Man's players, Sky, yeah, and the No Man's Sky actually pulled it off later. They they were able to reiterate yeah, it off and win back their player base. That's a horrible yeah. place to get from. So if we look and we think about this differently, what does it mean to have a four and five star rating? Okay, at that point when you have a four and five star rating, your adoption is ninety percent. So let's put this in a totally different terms. This is in on my talk as well. Um, now jumps to 3% or I'm sorry, a three-star rating or lower, right? Three-star, what happens? It's 50% adoption. 
Now let's talk about your other end of that. What does that mean to your pocketbook as an indie developer or even an enterprise? That means you now have to spend twice as much money on marketing. So there's generally a one-to-one -one rule for, for this. Every dollar that gets spent to develop, you should spend a dollar for marketing. Just for those of us that are indie out there that never did, that's kind of one of the rules that the enterprises follow. Now imagine if your game slips to a three-star rating, you get behind your player base, you're behind the cue ball, you have to try to win back your player base, and now you're spending twice as much money marketing dollars so there's a real dollar sign attached to this and everybody yeah. loses the players lose they don't have to have a bad experience and that's why you know shipping the highest quality software it's not just the same we keep throwing out there there's actual reasons for it monetarily to a company it's in the best interest all the way across the board from player experience to their bottom dollar yep and you know there's a lot of games out there that don't have the benefit of a built-in audience or or a loyal audience like there's a lot of games out there where if you disappoint the player in the first three minutes, it's just like, oh, well, I didn't need to play that. All these uh, all these games that are just sort of like one-off little side scrollers that are probably free to play, they're built on ad revenue. If they don't impress the, per the player within three or four minutes, that is it forever. Or, or maybe those games that don't feel it now that have that following and they're just kind of taking it for now, introduce mm -hmm. some competition, and I wonder what would happen. Yeah. yeah. I, I do... I do think it's interesting. One of the going back to the talk, the toxicity part. Um, I think there's something that we're like I noticed it on Instagram, right? Someone make an Instagram post, somebody in the comment alone will feel famous. Either they get tagged or they make the comment and everybody upvotes that. And so you talk about like people highlighting bugs these days. Back going back to the Ultima online experience, what what we did originally was felt powerful to be in wrongly, right? One of the things I did was I learned that if I crossed the server line in Ultima Online, I could duplicate gold, I hand it off to my buddy. I walk back from the server. I keep the gold. He keeps the gold. We could hear the hard drive move. And we made these extremely powerful uh, characters. Another one that we did was we got we took magical armor, put it on and had a poison rat hit us. It was weird. And we get poisoned. And we take the armor on and off. Our buddy would hand it to our buddy, give, give back to us. And we stat hacked these characters. Ultima Online's character cap was 100, but for their monsters, because to, to do parties, it was 1,000. So we became characters that were powerful at 1,000. And that was that feeling of power. I think it's the same feeling cheaters get, where they're coming in and they're, you know, I'm cheating. That, that was, I don't do it anymore. But back in the, 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 those days, and I had to power you know, a level, a level four, you know, chain lightning, and I'd kill whole guilds because they're powerful. But the toxicity, that's not, that's, that's, that is ruining a player experience, but it's cheating and that in and of itself is bad. But this sort of hyping up the bug or hyping up the toxicity, this Instagram feedback, this upvoting, this paying attention to the audience of somebody worked really, really, really hard on this product. And you're going to publish out all these bugs that you're seeking, not, not to, you know, play. Like I sort of feel if something's playable in game, like it's sort of that's, that's playable. It's a game. But I sort of, but then to publish the parts that are negative that, on that, it's toxic. It really is toxic. It, it needs to be called out for that. So is cheating on a level. I'm not going to try to defend it. I was young, but I mean, I think <laughs> as we educate people on that, they're ruining other people's player experiences. So it's an interesting story, but also has you know, yeah. double edged sword. Even in your own house, little known fact is that I grew up uh, in the household of an EverQuest addict. And yeah, and he would power level my character in the middle of the night while sleeping because he'd get bored with his like already cheated very a much like high level character. And then I would wake up and it would just like, I, I wouldn't want to play. So like, I'm just <laughs> putting it out that like the toxicity is online, but it could also be in your own home. It's amazing the development of the, uh, some of the stuff that happened around those early multiplayer experiences. I remember a story that I heard from Richard Gary. It's actually online in an interview, but but um, they created this thing called the background simulation in Ultima Online, which was a system by which all of the animals would act on certain behaviors. Uh, you know, goats wanted to eat grass, wolves wanted to hunt goats, dragons wanted to hoard gold. Th these things had things that they desire and things that they don't desire. And all these things had attributes. And if you ate the grass, it would take a while to replenish. Therefore, you could actually eat barren uh, these fields. Um, and they had the system working beautifully 
as a background simulation, we used to play it all the time, sort of go in there and we actually found cool things like the wolves are now hunting in packs. We didn't teach them to do that. It's just a thing that happened as a result of the, the unique combination of how they built the environment and these things, desires and, and aversions. And, um, and then the humans came in and they just mowed down everything, killed everything, cut down every tree, plowed every field. And at some point, Gary, it tells the story that um, six to eight months after release, they just turned off the background simulation and nobody noticed. They just weren't developing the features that um, actual humans, anonymous people on the internet desired. They developed what they wanted. And uh, I, I, I agree. It's really sad that that that's the way it turned out but i feel like you just described the matrix right there though like you're like hey they <laughs> built this perfect place for us and then the humans came along <laughs> yeah i just um, mowed it down quick question about some of these like finding bugs and doing these hacks um in terms of like the positive side of this i mean i know you see social videos of like folks doing very like wholesome uh i want to say like what are they called like flash mobs or hunting down something that didn't wasn't supposed to be hunted for like many yeah. many years or like finding bugs or like places that you can pass through but it's very wholesome and they're they're doing these sorts of things like where does that come into play on like whether or not the developer should fix those bugs uh i, I would so yeah i would think that if there's a something that's kind of benign um and it's not impacting your player base i would i mean i've seen games with millions of errors and mm -hmm. i would i would go down the list to just let's someday if they think they start complaining about it um then i would probably you know consider it but where i'm going to focus the time is where it negatively impacts uh that player base or yeah i would just friends. i i would uh focus on Exactly that. Like, uh, just how many how many people are is this affecting? How can I limit the blast radius? Um, that's where that's another Ultima Online fun story. Um, Ultima Online is where the term sharding came from that we all use now to talk about databases and cloud computing and stuff like that. It actually originated from exactly what Mac was talking about. You cross server boundaries, and these things would persist. Those are called shards. In, in Ultima Online, and that terminology became adopted by everyone else. But but I think that the important thing is to understand how can you limit the blast radius by limiting something to a shard, to an instance, to a small area, so that in the case of my favorite game currently, Elite Dangerous, I think anything that happens can only happen to 32 players at a time. There's only that many people in an instance. So, um, you know, it, you're only going to piss off that many people if you release it sort of slow slow roll like that. Um, and then Evelyn, I think I'm the other part of your point is how do how do those people play nice? Like how do you report something without the toxicity? Well, you there are there are bug bounties, right? Like in other apps and stuff, you can have you can get paid and you can tell people on the sly, by the way, you know, I found a way to, to just completely break your game. And um, you know, maybe maybe you might consider giving me money. Now, unfortunately, some people have abused that as well. You get so much false signals from that. Uh, but there, but there are other ways to get that that feedback to developers than saying, "Hey, look how cool I am," and give me five thousand million likes because I found th this bug. Um, I think you know part of this is uh, you know recognizing like what I did back then was wrong. I mean, we're talking thirty years ago, so I'm aging myself. Ultima Online, uh, in terms of duplicating, I I hate cheaters. I play Apex Legends and will watch people go through and with their automatic guns, and it's you don't want to play the game afterwards. And so I think if you're that level of, of, of toxicity where you're you're impacting other people's experience to that level, I think we do need as thought leaders to call it out for what it is. And that's the big problem here. Everybody's, I don't like, they could swap me, right? Like my name's, you know, you could start to probably digging up enough information on me. You could probably, and that, that level of toxicity goes from in game to out of game. And it gets even scarier. Um, we had G3 at uh, GDC this year. Um, the devs had to shut down a particular thing because they, there were several threats on their life prior to the release of, of the, the, this information. So, and they, they canceled it. They're, you're not going to get access to the devs, but but the people that are out there giving talks like me or whatever, I, I feel a moral responsibility on some level to call it out for what it is to help change the culture. Because this culture is one that has a, a checkered past 
and is one that needs to address the level of toxicity from top to bottom. Um, it needs to be more inclusive. We, we have a lot of other things that are going on. And I think it's only by getting those out in the open and talking about them and having other people gain awareness and understanding that we move the needle. Yeah, hundred percent. The sauce labs, 2023 gaming experience report had so many interesting stats on that specifically. Um, what is the role of the game industry in helping to improve the mental health of the developer? Well, I, I know they've started to, I mean, the, the game industry is famous for a lot of different things, but one of which was the hundred hour work week. Um, you know, Hey, the, the, what was they called? They had a name for it. The ship Mark. You remember what it was, Marcus, the shipping something Not even death it's March. It's, it's, we called it a death March. Yeah. But the business devs called it like the, the business people called it the, the, this let's do this sprint like, you know, or like their sprints are okay, but but, but there was another name for that they would use, and that was very toxic. They, they would burn out mm -hmm. developers, and the developers called them, like Marcus is saying, the death march. Um, when I built my own game, I did it to myself. I was working from like 8 a.m. till like 3 in the morning. I My eyeballs don't even do that anymore. Like I, I literally can't make my game over again because of how like much, you know. But that's, that's self-imposed. It's another thing to sit back and say, hey, inside of this industry, you know, you're expected to work these sort of hours. Uh, and there was that expectation and a lot of people want to work in gaming. There's a lot of passion there. So they're willing to look for lower wages. The gaming industry knows that. So they'll, they'll put barriers to entry where you have to come in on QA. So they'll bring really highly qualified people in on really low paying high, you know, under roles. Uh, and the gaming industry in and of itself needs to open itself up in my opinion to, to no longer siloing itself through, Hey, you have to have AAA experience to come on board. Um, maybe other type of project experiences should suffice and I can talk to those, right? Um, one studio should remain nameless. I, I, I originally came on board here as a, as a video game dev evangelist. I interviewed somewhere else for that job as well. And they came back on a different position was like, Hey, you don't have AAA experience. And I'm like, I feel like it's my responsibility to tell you from this other position I interviewed for here as you know, that this is really problematic because you offer tons of assets for free. You support this indie community massively. You you give away tons and tons of things to the community. Yet when it comes to getting a job with you, you've closed the door. And I think that industry, real this industry, really needs takes a long look. But this industry is one that's bigger than television, the movies, and music combined. So that sort of size is going to have pain. How do you regulate that? It, it, it has to be introspective. There's conversations like this that have to pop up. Yeah, and I think people need to be aware of that. And then it needs to come to sort of a, a reckoning and and more, you know, before too long about how it becomes better for all the way around, right? It's It's got layers of toxicity from the cake, the way the cake bakes all the way to the frosting. No, that was really well said. Thank you for, you know, I, I think taking that, that line because i think as an industry the only way the industry is going to get better is to speak out against like yeah. treating people poorly yeah. or uh, i mean but then there's the other piece of are we ever going to be able to avoid that the toxicity is one thing of how we treat developers internally within the studios then there's the toxicity that exists outside cultural how we treat the developers because of buggy games that honestly, are, is it really the fault of the developer? Is it, or is it just happenstance due to the fact that games have gotten a lot harder to develop? The windows of release have become much shorter. Uh, like it, it's, it's just kind of created this perfect storm. There's a lot more people involved when people adding people adds huge amounts of complexity and bureaucracy and uh, support issues and all, all sorts of stuff so yeah all of it i think it's all of it yeah it, yeah. it is all of it it's going to be really difficult um one of their releases it had ten thousand people working on it and they worked on it for five years or something like that so what is fifty thousand? am i even doing the math right like that's thousands of years how long does a human live 100 years so you have how many lifetimes not me are right, right. I mean, right. Maybe, maybe Marcus, we're going to hit, you know, we're 50, but anyways, uh, yeah. So half of that number, but the point here being thousands of man, man lifetimes, not man years, thousands of people's lifetimes. Right. And, and so what is that, 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 that's crazy to think that, you know, and then a developer 
in a smaller indie studio with five to 10 people is expected to somehow compete with, you know, 500,000, you know, man years or thousand lifetimes to in there. They can't make a game. So taking seven years as a solo developer to make a game is actually amazing. Um, and I don't think a lot of people understand that challenge in and of itself, like the other process. Um, and so for coding, for me, I can handle most stuff in, in like alerts or logging because I can log my stuff. But when you get in these bigger teams, that's where it becomes important to unwind the call stack and and get that information because the bigger teams will step on each other's toes. So that's another challenge. So yeah. there's all kinds of that. The, there's just a really big mechanism out there. And a lot of people don't realize that as a single person or a team of like even 30, how do I compete with 10,000 people times five years? Yeah. Right. It, but, it's just. And so you bring your toxicity to me. Fine. I'm just going to completely disregard it. Because when I know for my game, when you take the correct path, like Evelyn plays my game as an example, she's going to love the butterflies and catch some fish and get the story. And she's not, she's going to be, you want to play my game to not break it, to play it like you want to think about fishing and do it. It's going to function great. Play it to go try to jump on the water or go down the waterfalls or, or try to like, you know, slap a wolf or do it's, it's not going to work. You can slap a wolf in your you game. You can slap a gonna, wolf. You can try right, to, I'm you gonna... can try to get across the blocking volumes and come over there and, You've Fly sold me. The wolf. But <laughs> Mac, this was awesome. And what I feel like we've learned is that we need to do probably three additional episodes <laughs> on this topic and and get a bit further into it. Because this was this is really great. Thank you so much for hopping on and having some fun with us. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Uh, and and thank you for listening to this episode of Test Case Scenario. Hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Shoot an email to us at community-hub at saucelabs.com because I'm sure you probably have some questions for Mac or want to weigh in on the issue. We'd love to keep the conversation going and then we'll have to bring Mac back and read those questions back to you, Mac. So uh, until next time, take care. <laughs>